Hi everyone and welcome to Create a Story You Love. I'm so excited to have Thomas M. Sterner uh, with us to get today. He is the founder and CEO of the Practicing Mind Institute. And as a successful entrepreneur, he's considered an expert in present moment functioning. He is a popular and in-demand speaker who works with high performance individuals, including athlete, athletes, industry groups and individuals, helping them to operate effectively within high stress situations so they can break through to new levels of mastery. His amazing books, uh, The Practicing Mind and Fully Engaged, uh, teaches the process on how people can find clarity to accomplish more with less effort and in the least amount of time. Uh, Tom is also an accomplished musician, and he also worked 25 years as a chief concert piano technician for people like Pavarotti, which is awesome. <laughs> so when they did concerts, so that's awesome. Uh, and uh, he's also a private pilot and an avid sailor and a proficient golfer besides being a dad. So wow, <laughs> that's awesome. And uh, of course, you can find more on his website at www.tomsterner.com. So welcome, Tom. So great to have you today. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah. Well, let's let's just kind of dive in. Uh, uh, there is so much that I wanted to ask about, uh, you know, uh, both your books, but especially the practicing mind, because I just I felt like I had a bit of a breakthrough. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm just really hoping that uh, I just I feel like that's going to be the same for, you know, writers that are listening and creatives. Right. Um, so, you know, would you share your story and, and what inspired you to begin learning more about kind of the mechanics and the benefits of how self-awareness and your mindset influences everything you do? Well, what inspired me was really necessity. You know, was I, when I was growing up, I was like most people that are creative. I had a mind that was just always creating and always looking for something new to explore. And the problem with that for me was that the way that it manifested was that I didn't stay with anything. You know, when I first started playing music, I had so much music inside of me, and I started uh, actually on the guitar when I was very young, um, and I had to stop because the teacher that I had got ill, and I was only about, I was under five years old at the time. Uh, my father played guitar. And then we didn't have a piano. We got one when I was nine, and I started, and I think I was terrible at practicing. I was just absolutely terrible, and I hated it, and I think I, I lasted about nine months, and I felt like there was all this music I could hear and I wanted to play, but I just wasn't seeing the relationship between that and what I was doing on the piano every week. So I began to feel like I had this pattern, and I will say, to jump ahead a little bit, it was the observer in me that noticed it. In other words, I was... I was exhibiting the behavior and expressing the behavior, but there was a part of me that was watching this process. And I noticed that I never finished anything. You know, I didn't stay with these goals that I created. And it really, by the time I hit high school, it really made me feel like I had no power. Uh, because if I couldn't fulfill the things that I wanted to do, nobody was making me take piano lessons. If I couldn't fulfill those things, then I really was never going to be able to accomplish anything that I wanted. And so, I decided that I had to fix that problem. I had no idea um, how to change the behavior. But that was when I began being open to um, the thinking like, well, identify the problem and fix it. I've identified the problem, now I have to fix it. I'm not sure how I'm gonna do that. And when I got in college, my first year in college, a guy that was a, a very close friend of mine was taking a philosophy course and he gave me a book that was uh, from the course, a textbook, and it was Religions of the World. And I started reading about Zen and all that sort of thing, this present momentness, and I became fascinated by it. And I started um, really applying that to what I was doing and I started to see this change when I became more focused on the process of what I was doing and, and less on the, the product of what I was trying to accomplish. And that carried over into golf when I started playing golf mm -hmm. seriously later in my 20s. And I became very interested in sports psychology and peak performance studies because I just wanted, I was a voracious learner. I just wanted to learn everything I could about this. And what fascinated me there was that everything that we were proving in our empirical studies was what the Eastern thought had been saying for thousands of years. So they were really just two sides of the same coin expressed in different verbiage. And so that was when I realized, you know, this is how we function at our highest level and how when we're functioning at this highest level, our interpretation of the experience 
is one of calmness and contentment and fulfilling, fulfillment, not incompleteness and anticipation of getting to some place that hasn't occurred yet. So that was really where everything began to change for me, and I just continued to research it over the next 35 years, and I, and I still research it. Before we get into more of the details of the practicing mind, would you explain your definition? What does it mean to sort of develop a practicing mind? Well, everything we do in life is comes from practice. It comes from repetition, and it, when we use the word practice, to me, it's in, there's an intention there. So for me, a practicing mind is a mind that intentionally repeats a specific activity with the intention to um, fulfill something, to accomplish something. So it's very conscious. It's aware of what it's doing. It's doing it for a purpose. And it's also non-judgmental. It's detached from the goal. It's not using, it only uses the goal as a rudder, not as an indicator of what hasn't been accomplished yet. That's a misuse of the goal. So yeah. what is happening in with the practicing mind is it's completely absorbed in the process of achieving, not anticipating achievement. You know, the, okay. Achieving is a goal, is, is a verb. Achievement yeah. is yeah. a noun, and it's yeah. a static point in time. So to me, we spend 98% of our time in the process of achieving and yeah. it, it, crossing the finish line only takes a second and the reason it means so much when we do cross the finish line is because of everything that led up to it so if we can shift into being absorbed and in finding our joy in the process then everything changes our interpretation of our whole life changes yes wow that's amazing and that is that is so true <laughs> Uh, and I think that's kind of where the breakthrough happened for me because I hadn't thought of it that way. So uh, just to kind of dive deeper into the practicing mind, you talk about how most of us normally are multitaskers throughout our day. True. <laughs> and you mentioned that the practicing mind is is quiet and that it has a laser-like pinpoint focus and accuracy. So, you know, what would, thinking of writers and, and I guess, I guess creatives uh, generally, uh, what is the starting place uh, to specifically help uh, creatives to develop that type of focus and that type of mindset? Well, focus, you know, to me comes from not a lot of thinking going on. You know, when you're, if you look at athletes, you know, when they're focusing, when they're at their highest level, like the golfer who's winning the tournament and he's coming down, you know, the, the last nine holes of the tournament on Sunday afternoon, yeah. if you watch him, there's not a lot of thought going on, and I mean, his thoughts are very thinned out. His eyes are very still. There's a lot of things that they've studied about this, is where are we inside when we're mm. functioning the zone or whatever you want to call it. And when we are in the present moment, and when we are in the process, and when we are fun, uh, focused, we have access to our total consciousness because our consciousness isn't dispersed with all this, these extraneous thoughts. So that's the reason why learning to achieve that and be in that state all the time i don't know that anybody can do it all the time but at least being able to try to bring it on demand when you need to mm -hmm. is a really big deal now the yeah. first thing we have to do <clears throat> you know people say well how do i get there you know how do i do this mm -hmm. and well the, the um the first thing you have to figure out is um you have to understand and experience and know when you're not there because see most of us just live in our behavior instead of actually observing our behavior so there's a big difference between people say well how do i become more patient yeah. well you have to you have to know when you're being impatient i mean people will say well that's kind of stupid no because usually when you're impatient you're just feeling impatient you're yeah. not watching yourself be impatient yeah. when you begin to be able to watch yourself be impatient to observe that then you give yourself choice then you can make a choice. This thought, this feeling, is um, this way of processing this mm -hmm. is not serving my happiness. Yeah. It's a road that I've been down many times. I need to go in this direction. But you can't do that if you're not separate from what you're experiencing. The only way I know that you can achieve this separateness is through what I'm calling thought awareness training. It's really nothing more than you could call it a meditation. Uh, those are just labels for a process of learning to be more separate from your thoughts instead of so in your thoughts. And, um, you know, there's two ways that work best. I mean, uh, I would stay away just for, in this context, I would stay away from guided meditations because mm -hmm. by um, default, guided meditations are asking you to think. I mean, they're saying do this, think that, see right. this, and it's not what we want. Yeah. We want to 
see what our mind is doing without our permission because the mind creates all day long. It's a, it's a problem solving machine. That's what it's designed to do. It's the reason why we don't yeah. live in caves. Yeah. So um, <laughs> it's trying to solve something. And if you don't give it something to solve, something for it to attach to, it goes into search mode and just starts looking for stuff. Yeah. So um, in order to be in control of that and to have a choice, you have to become separate from that and more the noticer and the observer of what your mind is doing. And understand that you are not your mind. Your mind is a separate machine and it does what it's designed to do. And it's either your master or um, or your slave, whichever you choose, whichever, however you learn to use it correctly. So to me, the two ways that work in the context of this is either a breath-based um, system or a phrase base, which some people would call a mantra based. If you're using a breath base, it's very simple and it only takes like 10 minutes a day. You know, um, you sit down, you um, assume a quiet position or a comfortable position in a chair, you close your eyes, just do, you just want to eliminate extraneous things that might distract you and make your mind think more. It's hard enough to stop it from thinking without visual cues. Yeah. So, um, and then you just watch your, your body breathe. If the temptation is to to control the breathing because you go, oh, I should breathe slower, I should breathe deeper. No, we're not doing yoga right now. We're just, you know, we're just trying to watch what the mind or uh, what the mind is doing and watch what the breath is doing. Uh, or you can use a simple phrase, I am still, I am quiet, I am successful, I, what, it, 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 just not too many words. And um, again, that's something to give your mind to latch on to. So in, in tell, instead of telling it, you've got free run, go think of whatever you want, you're saying, no, you're only going to think of these three words, and you say them over and over again. Yeah. It, that's the reason why, in my opinion, it doesn't matter what they are. And what you will find very quickly is that, and I do this with people, I say, look, we're going to do two minutes, and I want you to stop thinking for two minutes. Close your eyes, I'm up in front of you know a couple hundred people, and we're just going to stop here, and we're going to do two minutes of you. And when they come out of it, for for most of them, it's the first time they realize that they're not in control. You know that their mind um, is going running off, that they can't control it. Even when they're telling it to stop thinking, it continues yeah. to go. And that's an aha moment for a lot of people because if if they're not aware of that, then where is their mind most of the day? Well, their mind's wherever it wants to be, and you're with it. So. Um, that's when people realize, you know what, I'm really not accessing my thought capability because I'm in my thoughts and I'm just running around visiting them and every thought that your mind fires off has emotional content and you're experiencing that content and I see this with people all the time, you know, they describe something that happened earlier in the day that upset them and whatever that was, um, they've thought about it several times and every time they think about it, the the body releases the hormones and the stress it relives the stress and all these things that are that are not good so this is a very important practice and like i said 10 minutes a day uh, is is plenty and the the interesting thing is that people always interpret they go i i i'm not good at this and when i say why is that they say well because i can't stop my mind from thinking and i always i my response to that is well if if you can't stop your mind from thinking, it means you're noticing that your mind is thinking, which means you're on the other side of the curve, which is where you want to be. The, the, the curve, mm -hmm. the side you don't want to be on is where you're just in, in the thinking. You know? But if you're noticing and chasing your mind, you can't be doing that if you're not noticing what your mind is doing. So that's really a good meditation. And yeah. when you feel like you're chasing your mind a lot and bringing it back a lot, that means that you're getting a lot of repetitions of stopping your mind and bringing it back and that's really where all the juice is because when you notice your mind is run off your awareness of what your mind is doing without your permission goes up and your willpower goes up too because you're pulling it back so those those are good things and like I said that's where you have to start everything we're going to talk about today if you don't if you're not separate from what your mind is doing you can't do all the things that we're talking about so that's pretty much fundamental yeah so that's that's really um, what you were start, what you were saying at the beginning. That is really the observer in you, kind of watching what's going on, right? Hence the right. Med the meditation. Right, right. and the, the the observer doesn't judge. You know, the mind always judges, but the observer yeah. doesn't. Like what people. <clears throat> when they say like I'm bad at meditation no there's no such thing as a bad meditation there is no such thing as a bad meditation <laughs> some days your mind is very active because of stuff that's going on in your life and so you're chasing it a lot 
Other times, and it could be the time of the day, you know, it could be early in the morning when you don't have a lot of thought or it's a day off and you don't have really anything stressing you out. Your mind may be very quiet. And you don't want to mistake that as, wow, I'm really getting ahead of this now because I'm, I'm getting good at this because my mind is very quiet. And then the next day, your mind's running all over the place. And then you tell your, you judge it. And then you say, no, I guess yeah. I'm not very good at this. You know, judging has no place in any of this. It, it, judging serves, you know, a, an analysis is fine. We have to analyze things to figure out what path we want to take. But judging has emotion in it. And it's this is good, this is bad, I'm not right. good at this. It, it, right. it affects your confidence and your ability to stay on track. Yeah. That totally makes sense. I do way too much of that, <laughs> just like now. <laughs> so, we all do. <laughs> so uh, yeah, oh, that's that's really good. That's really insightful. Um, so uh, you know, sometimes, uh, and now you talked you talked a bit about that. Um, um, but uh, would you talk about what it means to focus on the process and the benefits of being able to focus our minds in the present moment? Um, you know, in in what we are doing right now, like, um, for example, like, I, I just remember reading in your book, um, that you were just saying that there's expectations and results that we need to let go of when we are in the process when we're in the zone. Would you would you talk about that? Uh, just to help people that are listening to really kind of get that? Well, I think that one of the things as writers and creative people we have to understand is that we're involved in an infinite art form. Yeah. And the we're not real good with that because, you know, mo for most of us we have too much going on in our life, so we want we naturally want to feel closure on things yeah. if you think about it. Yeah. We want the uh, the trip to the grocery store over with. You know, we want the kids picked up. You know, we want the report done. We want to take stuff off of our plate. So we want to feel closure on things. So when we embark on something that is infinite and mm -hmm. that is never going to be done, that's not that doesn't feel comfortable to no. us. But <laughs> what we have to understand is that the reason it's infinite is because perfection is infinite. Perfection can't be a number. You, if you could get only get this good on the piano, if you could only be this good of a writer, then it wouldn't be perfection because it would just be a limit and another number. So we really want to embrace the infinite nature of what we do. And that's where, when you can do that and you can accept that, then you can realize that when you're just in the process of what you're doing, you're, you're exactly where you're supposed to be and yeah. you're living perfection in that moment. That's, um, and you can let go of, again, going back to, we have to have goals because goals are like the bullseye for the archer. You know, the archer, if the archer doesn't have a bullseye to aim at, then the arrows are just flying all over the place. He's exerting all this energy, pulling the, you know, the string back and shooting the arrow, but the arrow, it's not productive because he has no place to aim um, the arrow. So we have to have a bullseye. Mm -hmm. That, um, we just don't want to misuse that goal. And, you know, there's a story in The Practicing Mind, I think that demonstrates that very well, because I've done, uh, at times in my life, I've done a lot of target archery shooting. And I read this story once about an, an archery coach, an Olympic archery coach, and I believe it was in the 70s. And back then, this Zen type thing was not, well, sports psychology it doesn't, it didn't exist then. So um, what he, he found was that the American team could not compete against the Asian teams because the Asian teams, by default, were focused on the process of drawing the bow. They would just draw the bow, the whole process of drawing the bow and breathing and holding fast until it was um, letting go in between heartbeats. All the stuff they were doing, that was their joy, was just being in the process of drawing the bow. It was so beautiful to watch them. And the bullseye would just get in the way. You know, you got, you got like um, three arrows, you know, and they'd just thwack, 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 you know, yeah. and they would have bullseyes. The Americans were completely attached to getting bullseyes. So for them, it was like okay. the only reason they drew the bow was they could let the arrow go and see if they got a bullseye. So what would happen is if, if they shot the first arrow and it was you know high and to the left, they would this internal dialogue would start like, I only get three hours and I've already messed one. And, and all this in, internal self-talk yes. would have an judgment and everything. And their shooting would erode, you know, and the um, this was really noticed by this particular coach. Like, why can't we compete against these people? And it was because one was process oriented and one was goal oriented. So, you know, when you learn to be more process oriented, focus happens naturally because your mind isn't anywhere but what it's doing right now. That's why I said earlier, you have total access to your consciousness. Yeah. And that's just the natural state of being process oriented. That's why all the studies have shown 
that we are functioning at our highest level. You know, we get more done with less time and our experience of it is not a sense of struggle. It's a, it's a sense of contentment because we feel like yeah. I'm, I'm completely successful because I'm right here in this moment and there's no judgment. You know, people say, well, I can't keep, I can't stay in the process. Well, if you notice that you're out of the process, that's perfect. That's perfect practice. You know, that's yeah. just part of the practice. You're going to fall out of the process. Everybody does. And the, the part of the practice is pulling yourself back in. As long as you're going through that cycle of noticing, it's just like in the meditation. Your mind runs off, you notice it, you pull it back. That's perfect meditation. So people don't want to approach this as, um, when I'm good at this practicing stuff, yeah. then I'm going to be happy. No, because you that's, <laughs> that's exactly what we don't want. You know, yeah. we just want you to let go and practice. And some days you're going to be more efficient. And other days you're going to be more pulling yourself back into the process. It's all normal and it's just all part of what you have to learn to do. Yeah, that's really good. Um, and I, you know, that's interesting. That is um, just such an aha moment. <laughs> uh, because I, I, you know, for fun, I'll sit and just play the piano because I, I, I've done that for years, right? It's just kind of a fun thing now. And, um, and I'll be in the present moment and I really enjoy it. Um, but sometimes when I'm writing, I feel like the learning curve is higher and I'm feeling this um, um, chasing the goal thing, you know, instead of um, feeling like I'm in the present moment, right? And, uh, but like, yeah, I, that is just, um, um, I don't know, something I guess that you retrain, you observe your mind and then, and then step back, right? Well, I think it's easier... The other thing that you're describing is a sense of struggle. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, when you're when you're writing, you're, what you're describing is you feel a sense of struggle. Yeah. And I think that what we do is we misinterpret what struggle really means. If you look at a musician, when a musician first starts on the piano, mm -hmm. they're trying to figure out where the notes on the paper are on the instrument and yeah. which finger presses what note. And that feels like a sense of struggle. There's a, it's a feeling. They do, we call it, we're just labeling it mm -hmm. with the word struggle, but it's yeah. a feeling we get inside. And yeah. that's because we're up against our threshold of what we have mastered. We haven't mastered that yet, so yeah. we have this feeling that it's difficult, and that's another label. Oh, okay. um, but it's just a feeling that's indicating where we are in the learning curve. Yeah. So then if you look at that same piano student a year from then, now they're, they're practicing maybe a simple classical piece. Mm -hmm. um, now, they're not trying to figure out where the notes are on the, on the instrument anymore. That's, they've mastered that. Yeah. So that doesn't feel like a sense of struggle. But what yeah. they're doing now feels like a sense of struggle because their threshold has moved. So now they're, but they're still up against that threshold because as artists and creators, we're always up against our threshold because that's yeah. the nature of who we are. We always, we always want to write something better. We always want to play something more that's difficult. <laughs> so we're always up against that threshold. So yeah. if we don't pay attention to that, we can begin to feel, and this happened to me, that we're not improving because we're yes. always up against, we're always in that point, you know, we, we're always up against what we can do. And so we're, it's like the kids with the video games, you know, as soon as they master the video game, they get rid of it and get one that's harder. You know, yeah. and that's what we do. You know, what, what, it's the it's built into our natural DNA so that we don't stagnate. We always want to expand. We always want to get better. Yeah. But if we don't pay attention to that, we misinterpret that feeling, and that feeling makes us feel. Uh, we interpret that feeling as being unpleasant. You know, but it's really just an indicator that we're up against that we're learning. You know, we're right? we're in the process of mastering something. So when I feel uh, I'm struggling. In any situation, whether it's mm -hmm. dealing with a certain something that's happening in my life or something more mechanical like a golf swing or something like that, uh, to me it's just a trigger that tells me I'm not very good at this, and that's why I feel this way. But this is my opportunity to get better. If right. I don't, if I'm not feeling that way, that means I'm doing something that's already easy. We don't, we don't feel a sense of struggle walking across the room. I mean, most of us, you know, we, but oh, there was a time when we were toddlers yeah. when we did, you know, like, oh, but now we don't, we don't think about it. And we don't think it's a big deal. So that's not that's beyond us, and we've mastered it. So I think we really need to pay attention to that as creative people, because it's we want to feel like we're up against. When we feel that, it's a good thing. It means that we're up against what we can do, and we're moving that threshold forward. That's not a bad thing. Yeah, it's like sometimes these are unrealistic expectations that cause us to really judge ourselves, and which which you know is like the hamster on the wheel, right? Uh, because that ends up making us the judging part 
will take us out of the present. It'll take us out of the present moment because we won't be observers. Is that right? That's correct. And I think the reason that we, um, that is such, so indicative of our behavior now and our mindset is because, well, one of the reasons is because um, of like mobile devices. You know, the marketing media has access to us 24-7 yeah. through our phones, through our iPads, through our computers. I just had a discussion. I did a talk on Sunday and one of the guys that was at the talk was, was talking to me afterwards and he works in the credit card industry and he was telling me that um, he's privy to this information. He said, what is coming with smart TVs is that because it's all hooked into the cookies on your computer, it's like, you know, if you go out and you're looking for, like, say, pants, you know, uh, the next day you'll have a, on the side of your email, you have an advertisement for, say, a, a department store, you know, that sells pants. Right. And or on Amazon, you know, and he said, what is coming is two, two people on the same street can be watching the same show, but they'll see different commercials because wow. what they're doing is they're going to be analyzing what you look at and then the, the commercials are going to be crafted for you specifically. So you'll see one set of commercials, but the person who lives next door to you watching the same show will see different. Um, this is how far the fingers of this research go into. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, so it's, I mean, I could talk on this for quite a while, but the, the, the point is, is that, you know, we are exposed to this marketing media all the time. And the market, the engine of this marketing media is built on making us feel incomplete. You cannot be happy right now. You have got to have this thing over here or this experience. Life is passing you by because you don't have this. And, <clears throat> Or with the pharmaceuticals, it's you might be sick and don't know it, you know, so, you know, you need this this particular drug. And so and it just goes on and on. So we're constantly being pumped with this um, information that we're incomplete and we need to get someplace other than where we are now. That creates a sense of impatience and a sense of um, this, this need for instant gratification because we have this feeling of incompleteness which we're misinterpreting that feeling of incompleteness is there to make us want to expand again otherwise we would live in caves we would just be complacent we would say you know this is good enough um, we don't do that because there is this part of us that says we can grow we can be more we can do more we can find more we can learn more so that part of us is there but we misinterpret that into this feeling of I don't have what I need to be happy and I'm incomplete and that's where we that's what gets us into trouble so and that's what makes us feel um, that we're not where we need to be and we have to have we have to have something and we want it now because we want this feeling that's go inside of us to go away and if I just get this or that or this right. experience have this experience that that feeling will go away but it won't go away I mean we've all had things whether it was the prom dress the cell phone the you know it doesn't matter we've all one of these things we get them and, and we almost we have this very short-term gratification period and then we immediately replace it with the next thing that we got to have and uh, so that's how that all works and I yeah. think that when we begin to understand that then we give uh, once again we are developing awareness we're developing self-awareness we're becoming more of the observer when we have that feeling we go ah, oh, I'm having that feeling you begin to watch commercials and you see the commercial from the observer instead of right. being manipulated by the commercial. Yeah. There's a, a story I'm fully engaged uh, in, in my follow-up book that I wrote about where I, I saw this documentary on this uh, big international airport in Germany. And what they did was when they were designing the, the, the airport, they designed it so that there was a retail center as like the hub of a wheel. And all of the concords came in like spokes on a wheel. And their, their research showed them that because it was an international airport, that what was going to happen would be all these people would be coming into this airport from long extended flights because it was international. And they would have a sense of the research psychologically showed them these people would have a sense of loss of control. So buying something would give them a sense of control. Right. So that was how they designed this thing. And they even went so far as running people through there with glasses that had uh, lasers on them so they could track their eye movements uh, through the counters and everything so that they could design the counters to manipulate their eye movement to look at certain things. I mean, the research that goes into this stuff is mind-boggling <laughs> and frightening. Yeah. The amount of um, effort that goes into manipulating us. But again, that is what is happening. And if you're not, there's a saying, you know, as pilots, it says, um, in life, you're either a passenger or a pilot, you know, so if you're, you know, if you're in these, if you're not the pilot, 
then you're just being uh, manipulated. And so once you start to separate from that and become more observer oriented, then it has no impact on you. And then you begin to have the opportunity to choose. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember you um, telling the story of, of the nature of a flower. That was a s- portion of a, a long story that I wrote about the life of a flower. And I basically said, you know, at what point in a flower's life is it perfect? Is it when it's a seed? Yeah. Is it when it um, is germinating? Is it when it pokes its head through the ground? Is it when it blooms? Is it when it, it, it dies and goes back into the soil? Well, the the truth is it's perfect it's a perfect flower all the time it doesn't the seed doesn't say this really stinks i got to live in this mud until i bloom i mean it doesn't do that it's just perfect all the time we always feel impatient to get someplace other than where we are right now because we have this false sense of what perfection is and we feel like when i can just get to here when i can just have this when i can just do this once again back to the then this feeling is going to go away. And yeah. no, it's not because yeah. it's supposed to be there. You're like, um, you're just misinterpreting what it means. Yeah. So uh, you do talk in your book about how habits and practice. So both of those are interrelated because I, th- I think you mentioned that what we practice will become a habit. So how, how can we become more aware of what habits we are forming, you know, and, and to turn undesirable habits, which probably most of us have, <laughs> into good habits. Well, the, the I mean, there's been a lot of studies of habits and how they're formed, and um, especially by corporate America, because they're trying to utilize habits to make us do, do what they want. You yeah. know, so um, it's very important that we understand habits. And, you know, habits are basically, the way that the mind works is it looks for repetitive things. Because repetitive things, things that we repeat often, if it can habitualize them, it, it takes very little computational energy to, um, to uh, execute a habit. So when it sees you doing something over and over again, it goes, ah, this we can make into a habit. And then, um, then when this particular stimulus comes up, we just execute the habit and it takes almost nothing. Yeah. So, you know, because when the mind is learning something new, it takes all of its computational power. That's why when you're learning something new, it's so easy to stay in the present moment because your mind can't go anywhere else. It just gets absorbed into what you're doing. That's the irony, you know, but the better you get at it, the more proficient, the harder it gets because it it just becomes effortless for you. So the problem with habits is there's not any conscious choice in them. They just get executed. So So they just get fired off. So that's why I say anything that you're repeating, whether it's physical in a golf swing, uh, a run on the piano, or a behavior, yeah. is going to become a habit. Now, how do you know that? Um, how, you know, how do you separate yourself from that? Well, we're back to the thought awareness training. That's why I yeah. said in the beginning, if you don't do that, you can't do anything that we're talking about. As you do that, you will become more aware of what you're doing all day long. And you'll start to see, you know, I have a tendency to... This is one of my habits. This, the way that I behave yeah. in this situation is a habit. Instead of you just being in the behavior, you'll start to watch the behavior. Yeah. And that's when you have the opportunity to say, this habit isn't serving my happiness. I need to change it. And if you can understand that, okay, so now you make a decision as to what, um, how you want to replace that habit. And uh, what with what what habit you want to replace it with and then you decide well how am I going to do that like what are the mechanics of this new habit and after you do that it's as simple as just being aware of when you start to execute the old habit and then execute the new habit and with the understanding and I say to people just repeat and relax because anything you repeat is going to be is going to be a habit so yeah. if you do this when situation A comes up and you decide, I don't want to do that, I want to do this. If every time that comes up, you're aware of it, there's going to be a natural pull to execute the old habit. And that's when you get that chance to stop and execute this habit. And when you do that, it, it starts to replace this one. But it takes so many repetitions and so much time yeah. for the brain to do that. And that's where I think people fall down. Because if I tell you, um, if you knew mm-hmm. that, Look, if you change, if you, the way you react in this situation, if you change that to this, in 25 times, this way over here is going to be the way you, you um, behave in that situation. This old way, you won't do anymore. Well, if you knew that, then what would happen is when you're 15 repetitions into this habit, you won't be going, I should know this by now. I'm not very good at this. See, that's where people fall down because they expect when they want to change a habit, they're thinking like, well, I've, 
I've tried to change this habit like five times. Well, if it takes 30 times, you're only, you've only five times into it. So just relax and just keep repeating it. When you get up to 30 times, you'll see you, you, that you've repeated it. That's, I think, what, why it's helpful for people to understand. Just repeat and relax. Understand what you want to change um, and then work at moving it into this direction into whatever your replacement is for that. And what, you'll just change the synapses in the brain and it will become the normal way. that It'll feel normal. Then the old way won't feel normal anymore. So it's really, it's not so much that it's hard. I think mm -hmm. that what happens with people is they're very impatient because of all the program, and they think I should be good at this now. And yeah. um, and that's why I say, you know, one of the things that I, I've said is like, you know, if you take something like, there's another chapter in Fully Engaged, which is creating goals with realistic data. So you stop sabotaging your, your confidence. And yeah. so again, if you, the example that I've always used because everybody can understand it is if you say, I wanna lose 30 pounds, that should take me 10 days. Well, that's mm -hmm. absurd. We all know that's absurd. Yeah. Because we know that's absurd, we can see the um, how it's going to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what we do. That model is what we use for so many things that we do. But in using that model, five days into it, even if we have changed our eating habits and we're exercising, we're doing all this healthy stuff, five days into it, we've lost maybe, I don't know, six, seven pounds. We feel like a failure. And we begin to question our ability to even accomplish goals in general when we may be actually moving at an accelerator rate and much better than we should be um, at that particular time. And, but our, our interpretation of that is that we're not very good at this and um, so we might as well just give up on it. But that's because we didn't have accurate data when we started. And so we've, we've, our point of relativity and our timeline is all out of whack. And that's the reason why I think that it's important to understand when you're trying to change your habits, you have to understand it takes time for the brain to change the habit. It, there's there's, a mecha there's physical things that have to happen in the brain for the habit to be changed. And that takes so many repetitions. And you don't know exactly how many repetitions it is, but it's not two. No. <laughs> you know, so, um, so that's the reason why um, we need to be patient. That's why I tell people, just repeat and relax. It'll happen. Yeah. You do talk about, uh, in your book, the the four you you call them the four s words simplify small short and slow and you know would you would you share how practicing each of these uh techniques helps people to stay present in their project um yeah, yeah. i think you know again we tend to when we take on a new goal whether it's a skill development we always immediately focus on the end you know the yeah. um the goal itself and what that does is put us at war with the process, you know, yeah. because what we're saying is when I get there, then I can be happy. But before I get there, I got to go through all this stuff. And that's a nuisance, you know, that I have to live through so I can finally feel the way I'm going to feel when I get to the to the goal yes. at the other end. And it becomes very difficult to keep ourselves in the present moment because we're always being pulled towards the goal because that's what we've done our whole life. So people say, well, how do I stay in the present moment? I said, well, you know, by using things like, first of all, you know, you simplify the goal. Like if you say, um, if you're working on a piece of music, say, or if you're writing and you say, you know, I'm just going to write uh, um, two paragraphs. That's all I'm going to write. Mm -hmm. You know, what? Um, if it takes me two hours, it takes me two hours. If that's your goal, then you'll do it. If you sit down to write and you go, I've got to get the next two chapters done, you know, well, you've immediately put yourself in a position where it may not be possible on that day, depending on where your mind is and how your creativity is flowing, to write two chapters. So if you begin to simplify stuff by breaking it down into smaller pieces, and when you're trying to change things about yourself, um, you should, uh, when I say shorter, it's it's how much time you spend at it because we get exhausted. You know, when we're trying to change behaviors of thought, we can only focus on that for so long because we're not good at it. So it's important yeah. to pick certain amounts of time to work on that. Like my, my sister asked me one time, she called me and she said, I tried to be present moment yesterday and it just didn't work. And I said, well, the problem with that sentence is the word yesterday. I said, like, you can't do it all day. I said, try to be present moment from 9 to 9.15, you know, yeah. to start out. <laughs> Like, um, instead of saying yesterday, I said, nobody can be present moment the whole day. It just is against our nature, and there's too many stimulus outside of us to pull us out. And then you just be, get into this. That's, again, making goals with unrealistic data, or not complete data, and it's unrealistic. So, you know, you want to break things down into achievable results. And that's 
they're all those words are all tied together. That's simplifying it. Mm -hmm. It's um, and it's shortening the time that you're going to spend working on it so that it's achievable. And slowing is um, it's also breaking down. You simplifying it by breaking it down into smaller pieces um, that you're going to work on. Only two chapters or only two paragraphs, and then. Um, you know, maybe you're only going to write for an hour and a half. I mean, you know, anytime we have we sit down and we're asking our mind to really focus, um, I, you know, I have to do a lot of voiceover work, and I break that down into small sections because I can only concentrate at a high level for so long, and then I just start to make a lot of mistakes. So pushing past that doesn't nece it's not necessarily productive, and I don't want to judge myself and say, you know, I'm really not very good at this. As long as I break it down and I stay in small sections, I'm very successful at it. And the other thing is slowing things down. You know, it's it's very difficult to do anything slow because we don't do anything slow. You know, everything we do, we're in a hurry. So when you can slow down, that's when um, you can. It takes like if you if I said to you, I want you to walk across the room very slowly, very mindfully. You know, uh, that's I, that could be that word could be substituted for slowly. It's just very mindfully where you're completely absorbed in what you're doing. It pulls the mind into complete presentness because um, it can't be thinking of other things because the mind resists being slow. It wants to go very fast. So it's a, when you feel yourself like your mind is running all over the place, even something simple like brushing your teeth, if you try to slow yourself down so you're not just like this but just to be very mindful of what you're doing, it's amazing how it pulls the mind into the present moment. Your thoughts thin out. Everything slows down. So those things, all those words work together to pull you into the present moment. I'm going to be practicing that <laughs> with my writing. That's awesome. Uh, well, even trying to apply the four S words brings you into the present moment because it means that you're focusing on what you're doing right now. You know, like yeah. again, if you go, how do I how do I break this down using the four S words? Well, you can't do that. You can't even have that thought unless you're in the present moment. You know, there yeah. you're not thinking about the grocery trip later in the day. You're not thinking about something else you have to do tomorrow or something you shouldn't have said yesterday. None of that is there yeah. because you're trying to apply these four S words to what you're doing right now. And that's perfect practice. That's being totally in the present moment. So I'm going to make a sticky note with those four words on it. And I'm going to put it on that <laughs> computer because it's really going to help, I think, uh, to focus, right? Um, right. Yes. No, that's that's really good. Um, and so would you say that present moment um, thinking and practice, does that help um, like creatives get out of those self-defeating cycles, um, which I guess, you know, like procrastination and frustration with our work or where we're at in our work, does that, does that help to get out of those cycles, do you, would you say? Yeah, I do. I think that, you know, I mean, I've certainly experienced procrastination and, and um, mind blocks. And one of the things for writers is that, um, we tend to we tend to try to make the first draft the final draft, you know, which is a big mistake. You know, just get something down. You can always go back and, and change it. But we have this feeling of we start writing, and nah, that's not really want to say. You know, nah, that doesn't sound good. Just write, you know, like write, you, and then go back. And I find when I do that, that's when I can go back and the ideas start to change, and I start re refining. But one of the, the problems that we have is we we try to write the first the final draft on the first pass and that's really and people have talked about that before yeah. the other thing with procrastination is I we I think we tend to see the whole goal we, we, when we approach something that's what we see is the all this work that right. needs to be done. right and um, and that's what makes us feel like oh, it's overwhelming instead of that's when you know you're not in the present moment and that you're you're looking at um, you're attached to the goal which is being finished with everything if you that's why I said you can break it back and say if you're looking at a piece of classical music you know I'm just gonna do the first I'm gonna work on the first four measures today you know that's what I can tell you from years of being high-level concert pan technicians that's what those guys do. All the best musicians in the world, that's what they do. I have been on stage when they're practicing like a five or six note motif for 20 minutes. Wow. You know, I'm just sitting there going, da -na -na -na, da -na 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 -na, so that they're, they're so immersed in it that when it comes time for them to execute, mm -hmm. it's effortless for their brain because yeah. they run through it so many times. But they're not thinking about, I got to I got to practice the whole piece over and over again. They don't work like that. They work on very small sections. And that's why, again, um, they're used to breaking things down and not seeing the, um, 
the goal, not saying that their goal is just to work on this. It's not mm -hmm. this. And that's the big difference. Yeah. Uh, and I think that as writers, it's very easy to say, uh, I'm only on the first chapter of this new book. I've got, I've got all these chapters right. You know, and, and it just becomes overwhelming for them. No, just think, I just want to get through this page. I just want to get through the next few paragraphs. If you can do that, because the procrastination, what makes us want to procrastinate is, is this feeling of there's just so much to do here. And, yeah. and that... So that feeling is coming from not being where you're at. It's coming to seeing the. It's coming from seeing the whole project as being finished. And if you can, you know, if you can be in the present moment, what happens is your goals they just flow towards you instead of you feeling like you're pawing towards them. You know, they just flow towards you, and it's a very different place to be. Yes, that is wow. <laughs> so much I'm learning. So much. This is so great. Um, and I, and I guess along with that, when you can, you know, get into that where you're just in that present moment, you're taking things slowly and you're observing yourself, that's probably where you're more relaxed and peaceful and feel probably more empowered. Would you say that? Well, you do, yeah, and you're content because you're where you feel like you should be. You're yeah. where you feel like you should be doing what you feel like you should be doing. And because you're there, it's self-perpetuating. Your mind is more efficient because, again, you have access to all of your consciousness. You have fewer thoughts, and the thoughts that you have are directly related with what you're doing. You're not sitting there feeling this anxiety of all the anxiousness that's going on. That's a, that's thinking that's going on, and that's emotion that's going on, and it's taking energy away that could be going into what you're doing. But you're not having these thoughts of, i got so much to do here. See, that thought has nothing to do with what you're doing. Yeah. All that thought is doing is interfering with what you're doing. Yeah. So when you eliminate that stuff and you feel perfectly content in where you're supposed to be in this moment doing what you're doing, mm -hmm. that's when you know your mind goes and it goes into this laser thing and there is nothing else. There's no judgment of where you're at. There's nothing except the creativity in this moment. And I think it's very important to say, look, you know, we can talk about this stuff all day. It takes practice to yes. be able to do this. Yes. So when you start to try to change your life into this, you're not going to be able to do it right away. But if you're working at it, then you're in perfect practice. This is why coaching, when I work with people, it's so important because they pretty quickly get off of that and they start falling back into old behaviors and judging themselves and they don't see the weight behind the boat. They have to be have somebody outside of themselves watching them and saying, now look, see, this is how you're processing this, that, you know, this is, this is what you're trying to avoid. Or they'll say, like, I'm not very good at this. And you'll say, no, look at how you were doing this two weeks ago. And then they go, oh, yeah, you're right. I, I am. I've moved a lot. But they don't see that when they're left to their own device. And right. I remember one time my uh, jazz piano teacher was telling me um, he was playing some stuff for me that I thought was uh, really sophisticated. And, and um and I was saying, like, you know, I, I don't think I could play that. And he said, well, he said, if you look at where you were when you started six months ago and what you're playing now, he said, you're way beyond where you were. He said, you might not be up to here. He said, but you're way beyond. See, and I wasn't seeing that, again, because I was always up against my threshold. So I was feeling like I wasn't getting any better, but I actually had come a long way. But I needed him to show me that. And that's one of the things that coaching does. It keeps, your, it keeps you motivated and it keeps your confidence up. Yeah. do need those reminders, right? <laughs> well, it's just like piano lessons. If you don't have yeah. to show up for a piano lesson, then you're not, you know, where you're accountable, then you don't feel like, you know, it's pretty easy to drop off of the practicing routine. Yeah. <laughs> but I also think it's very important for confidence. You know, you need someone to show you what you've accomplished. And if there are particular situations in your life that you tend to fall off the wagon and become judgmental, you need one of the th reasons why you coach over a period of time is you may not come up against those situations every day. You may only come up against them once a week or once every two weeks. So you need someone to observe to say, here's our strategy for the next time that shows up in your life. Yeah. And then you need for them to go through that because they can't execute what you're talking about until they're in the situation. Yeah. And then when they're in the situation, they get to execute. <clears throat> so that's one repetition of executing. And then you get to debrief and you go, OK, let's look at how you handle that this time versus the last time. And you can keep moving forward. But that's why it doesn't work to coach somebody one time. And um, and that's why I tell people, look, we don't have to meet every week. If if um, if this situation is something that you're not going to run up against for two weeks, 
well, you need to go through it before we can see how you did. You know, like um, so there's no reason for us to talk every week. So it's it's just understanding that that you know we're changing behaviors that we have habitualized our whole life, and changing those behaviors takes the opportunity to change them. You got to be in the situation that's creating the problem in order for you to execute what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's wow. Uh, there's so much. I'm gonna have to go back and listen myself. <laughs> that's so great. Well, uh, Tom, thank you so much for just sharing all your insights today. That's been really, really helpful. Yes. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, you know, I just, I really think it's going to empower, um, you know, writers specifically and, and other, obviously other creators too, but like just in their uh, journey, it'll be like a aha moment, I think, <laughs> for them. Yeah. So that's Great. awesome. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, would you would you share where people listening can find you and your books? And I don't know, maybe you could talk about if you have some new projects going on or what you have have going. Yeah, um, the they can find me at tomsterner dot com. There's also uh, the practicing mind institute dot com where they can join that for free and get a bunch of stuff. Um, there's also the original site, which was thepracticingmind.com, dot com, which has a bunch of stuff about the practicing mind book. As far as uh, me, we're releasing uh, the audio book for the audio version of The Practicing Mind has been out for years, but we're releasing fully engaged the audio version within a week. And so we'll be running a special on that. If you, you can, and you can find that out on TomSterner.com as soon as the page goes up, which should be any time. And uh, what we're going to do with that is if you, if you buy the fully engaged version, you get the Practicing Mind version for free. And uh, I've got... <clears throat> I will be finishing up a program for musicians, uh, which is a series of lectures that I've done, and I'm just basically digitizing that so people anywhere in the world can watch them. Yeah. And then also the other thing that will be coming is a basically just a practicing mind course, like an online course that you can take. Um, That'll be sometime later in the fall because we're we've got quite a bit of work left to do with that. But all that stuff, you know, if you just follow me on social media, whether it's Twitter, or Facebook, all that you'll have heads up for all that stuff. Oh, awesome. Wow, that sounds really good. Uh, I'd like to dive deeper into that. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you again, Tom. This has been so great. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you.